Okay, we're live. So this is the question section for Eliza. If anyone in the, in the audience has, uh, has questions for Dr. Grames, uh, go ahead and put them in and I will ask them. I have a lot of questions myself. I've, uh, I've been following Dr. Dr. Grames' work for a while now, uh, I guess for two years, maybe a year and a half. When was that first project we did together? A little more than a year ago. So it's, it's been fascinating to see the work develop and uh, I've really enjoyed reading a lot of your publications recently. Just based off your, 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 uh, your presentation, um, you know, I think it's very important to collect the kind of information you're collecting. I love the idea of the database you're building. I wonder how that impacts the, the things we can do to help prevent uh, biodiversity decline, the insect apocalypse. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? How does document review help fix the problem? Yeah, so that was that's a question a lot of people ask us about this project is, you know, like how much can we actually learn from historical data going forward? Um, and I think one of the problems is that a lot of people have the conception that there's not a lot of long term insect population data sets. So they point to a couple of, you know, the really key examples like the Rothamsted data set that's been going on for several decades as being, you know, what data we can use to understand this. But I think that there's so much data out there already published in the literature and you know we can't start a new insect monitoring project right now and wait 20 years for the results when you know we need to take conservation action now for the species and um, regions that are you know most threatened and so we have to use historical data to try to understand where we should be making decisions because it's just not really possible to wait for the results of a monitoring project so when you do that research, you know, when you're when you're pulling up these population changes, are you looking at, um, you know, what what amelioration effects, uh, you know, how how you can fix it? You know, if someone if someone stops using a pesticide, do you track that and see how the population responds? Are you looking at that sort of cause and effect kind of thing? Um, eventually, that's what we want to do. So right now, we're just cataloging like what data sets are out there that we could use to answer those questions. Um, because it's, you know, we don't want people reinventing the wheel every time they're trying to look for possible causes. So it's like, okay, here's all the studies that we've found and we are taking them by what the authors have described as being the main focus. Um, so like some of them that we've uh, looked at so far, they're like, we're looking at climate change or drought extremes or changes in land use around an area. Um, and so people could go and try to find those. Um, but that's not something we're specifically doing with this project. It's kind of one of those applications we want um, people to use the full database for. Yeah, so downstream, I suppose. Um, TJ has a question. I imagine there are geographic areas and taxa without any data. Do you have any idea of how to best convey or visualize the data gaps in order to inform direct future research? Yeah, I think that's one of the really important reasons to do things systematically is, you know, when we see a gap in data in the neotropics, for example, right now, and like the maps that I showed from the two previous big reviews on this topic, it's we're not sure if that's you know a true data gap where there just hasn't been anything collected or if it's just that we haven't found it when searching for data. Um, and so I think that's why we wanna do things so systematically and get so many people involved is that at, that at some point, someone will know if there is a data set there or if there's not. Um, so that's kind of how we're trying to approach the gaps because it's always hard to know, you know, is it a true gap or is it just, we haven't found it, so. Oh, uh, it looks like we got a question in the messages area. Let's see if I can read that real quick. Sarah asks, uh, hi, Tom. Not sure if this is the right place for the question. This will work. My question is, and sorry if I missed it, what databases did they search and did they run in, into any limits with running such a long search string? Also, awesome work. Uh, yeah, we definitely did. So we searched, oh, I can't remember how many databases. I think it was at least 16 databases for the first phase, and it's going to be about 45 for the entire thing. Um, so we searched. The main ones that we searched were Biosis Citation Index, Zoological Records, Scopus, um, Cab Abstracts, Cab Abstracts Archive, Academic Search Premier, Network Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations. So it's like it's every database I could think of essentially we searched. Um, and then we have a lot of um, like places that we're going to search for the later phases, which are more like organizational websites and repositories for like academies of sciences. 
Um, and we did, yeah, we ran into problems with the search. So on the big, um, like bibliographic databases, we didn't have any problem with, you know, the, I think it's like eight pages of search terms or something. Um, but yeah, for some of the smaller ones, we have to really restrict the search. And then we're basically just searching for insect and seeing, you know, if there's only 20 results in the database for insect, we're just going to screen all of them. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a limitation of trying to search broadly. You know, that's an interesting problem that a lot of people don't realize exists in this space. Uh, you know, a lot of people just search PubMed. We do that uh, for some of our work. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, is there is there a resource you know where you know you can look up all of the databases? Uh, I see with LitSearcher you've done some work like aggregating foreign journals, that kind of thing. Is there a resource that helps with that? Uh, I don't quote me on it, but I think Michael Dusenbauer was working on something that uh, identifies yeah. databases for searching. I think. I think Michael Gusenberg and Neil Hadaway had a publication about that recently. Um, but okay. I can't remember what journal it was in. So. Yeah, TJ asked a similar question. Forty-five databases is a lot of databases. It seems like we need to get a handle on, you know, all of those different sources. Um, yeah, that's one of the nice things that we can do because we have searched across so many of these two. Is we can compare, you know, where did we actually get unique results? Because it might be that some of them are completely redundant, um, and we could suggest, you know, in the future you don't necessarily need to search these. Um, so I also wanted to ask about, I, I, well, you graduated recently. You're at uh, University of Nevada, Reno now. And uh, one, of the, one of the things you talk about taking on is expanding this work to undigitize historical records. Something we talk about uh, at CISREV a lot is the idea to expand uh, evidence synthesis approaches to uh, other kinds of documents. We talk about images a lot. It seems like that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, do you think that there's a lot of value in doing that to adding to your database? Do you think that there's, you know, a comparable amount of data there, way more data? Uh, I guess people call this gray literature sometimes. Um, yeah, wh what do you think about the value of that approach? Yeah, no, I think it's really important, especially for getting the baseline data, because, um, you know, a lot of studies that are easy to find in archives that are from, you know, after the 1960s or 1970s, when a lot of land use changes and pesticides and stuff have already been out there. Um, and so, you know, you might not actually know what the true baseline, you know, fluctuations in population numbers are between years, because insect populations, you know, they vary really, really dramatically between years. And so to understand that baseline, we have to go back as far as we can. Um, we can get some of that from actually um, like paleoecology studies where they've taken, there's one study we found an entogen that's really cool. They did um, lake core, like lake sediment core samples, and then they counted the density of midge heads per meter squared <laughs> to, you know, like indexes, like how many um, <laughs> of these midges there were. Um, and so we can use stuff like that, but we can also use these older databases, um, and especially like a lot of regional bulletins um, from like the 1800s where people were tracking insects as pests or as, you know, agricultural or timber pests, but also sometimes there's just, you know, like a butterfly enthusiast. Um, and so that can help us get a sense of what the baseline data is. So I actually think that's pretty important. It's a little bit like climate change, right? Like to, to know that things are hot now, you need to know that things were not so hot. <laughs> so yeah. you, you have to go way back to figure that out. And I guess with, with insect populations, it's easy to to forget that, like you know, you can't you can't go back like more than I mean, how, how far do you think you can go? You can't go back ten thousand years, right? I would imagine that. Are there logs from ancient Rome on insect populations? How far back have you managed to go? I think somebody found like a three thousand year old data set of like monitoring insects in China, um, but yeah. it's you know it's only when it's something that's like really culturally important that those records exist. So. Um, so James, uh, one of our excellent developers and researchers at CISREV, James Warden, uh, he, he asks uh, approximately how many graphs are processed with meta digitize? I, I, I also think that the meta digitize package is fascinating. Uh, he asks what, what is the data validation step like to confirm that it was correctly extracted? So how many graphs and, and how do you validate that it was correct? 
Um, so right now we haven't started doing like the formal extraction of everything. It's mostly just when I find a study that I think is really interesting and I want to look at what the trends are, um, I pulled it out. Um, so we haven't really done any of the validation yet, but in general, our approach for everything in Entrogen is at least two people look at every article. Um, and so we're going to do the same thing probably with the data extraction where two people will do the digitization and then we'll, you know, average them or see, you know, if there's big discrepancies, then a third person will come in and extract the data. So, so something we try to encourage a lot, I, this is, feels a, lot, a little bit like a tangent. I, I really like that package, meta digitize, and uh, I, I don't know, just, just the idea of like pulling out the raw images of figures and figuring out where the data lies, you know, the actual data behind it uh, seems really useful. I, I don't know. Actually kind of comes back to the gray literature or other kinds of documents, you know, like you could review just the graphs and in, uh, in, in papers. Um, but I want to, I want to take another question. I received from a different source. Uh, a, a big thing we try to do is encourage collaboration between people uh, on CISREV, well, in evidence synthesis in general. And, uh, you know, not, not because of us, but when, when you came to CISREV, you really brought a lot of people with you. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating to see those communities grow. You know, uh, you, a lot of the people who did work with you are, are now doing their own projects and extracting information. Um, you mentioned wanting to find more partners and collaborators. Uh, what, what types of partners are you looking for? Are you looking for people to just do a review? Are you looking for people to sort of do their own projects? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, both, I guess. So we're always happy to have more people come in and help with the title and abstract screening, um, and then especially to lead sub projects. So if somebody, you know, we've got the projects going for, you know, bees and wasps and ants, and then for dragonflies and damselflies right now. But if somebody is just really, really excited about what's going on with walking sticks or what's going on with thrips, you know, we have that data and we can pull it, and anybody can, you know, take on a sub project and coordinate it and just like make it their own as long as they're following, you know, the general end-to-gem principles that everybody agreed on for the protocol. Um, you know, we want people to take those on and just, you know, feel like they can kind of run with it if it's their area of expertise. Um, and then same thing for uh, regional or language-specific projects. You know, we really want someone who can do a review of, um, you know, French language articles from Africa or something where, you know, we're not finding that data right now and it might just be because, you know, we don't have the expertise to do those searches and the screening especially. So. Do, you, do you have an example of, of somebody who, who is doing this work that, uh, you know, you're trying to integrate what they've done into your eventual database? Yeah, so we just started, um, so uh, Juan Sebastian Caceres is going to lead a, like, Latin America Entogen, which is fan, like, it's absolutely great, um, so it's going to cover um, Spanish and Portuguese and just everything that we're missing right now from the new topics in South America, um, and so we're still kind of in the process of getting that set up and figuring, you know, how are we going to do the search translation, you know, should we do a one-to-one -one search of the Entogen one, or should we run Lit Searcher on a subset of our that are already published in Spanish and Portuguese to come up with the terms being used there. Um, you know, things don't translate directly, especially when you're dealing with technical jargon. It's not necessarily the same thing. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to figure that out, and then that will be hopefully the next project that we upload into CISREV is all of those articles. So. You know, when you incorporate people doing sort of their own approaches and then having that data integrate into some, you know, central database, uh, a question that often comes up is is quality control. So uh, you know, I typically go with the assumption that everyone's going to do an amazing job. You know, and then if there are problems, like we have to have tools to to help identify those problems. Um, do you think quality control is is have you run into that issue already, or do you have methods for controlling uh, quality? Yeah. So. Since we want the project to be open to, you know, anyone who wants to get involved and is interested in insect conservation, um, that was a big concern people had originally is, you know, do you need to have some type of qualification to do this? Um, but since, you know, we want it to be open, we said, no, anyone can do it, and we're just going to put in quality control measures. And so we have two people screen every article, um, and then we also um, kind of track. so. For when there are discrepancies, so if there's a conflict and someone says included and somebody says excluded, a third person comes in and makes the final decision. Um, and the people who make the final decision are kind of like a core group of screeners who've been involved since the beginning. Um, and so then we can use those um, 
like conflict resolutions to estimate false positive and false negative screening rates for every single reviewer. Um, and so if somebody's kind of, you know, if their graph is going off a little bit too high into false negative, which means that they're just excluding articles that should actually be included, I'll send them an email and be like, hey, I think you're consistently making, you know, this mistake, like double check the inclusion criteria. And, you know, usually it's just a misunderstanding of what the inclusion criteria are. Um, especially because we have a lot of undergrads working on the project, which is, you know, really great because they're learning how to do systematic review and learning a ton about ecology and insects and everything as they're reading the abstracts. And even study design where, you know, that's one of the things that I think people use the wrong label for the most is what a laboratory or mesocosm study is because we don't want to include studies where people are just keeping, you know, a population of flower beetles in the lab in a tank. Um, and so that's one of the things where it's like, okay, this is just like a teaching moment. We'll go over what a mesocosm study is. And I'm like, after that, usually the little line that we're tracking of false negative rates goes back down. So that's, that's a fascinating topic. I, I want to dig into that a little bit, but I did miss a question from uh, Hannah Wood. Uh, she's a PhD student and she says, thanks. Great talk. And wow, a lot of papers. Uh, 143,000, I think you said, something like that. It's crazy. Uh, having done a protocol in advance, did you find yourself having to adapt it at all when you, uh, when you started? Or would you have designed it, any, designed it any differently having then done the literature analysis? Yep, there's now a version two of the protocol. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we edited it and then posted it up on um, Open Science Framework again, where we have the new version two and then also a version with track changes so people can see what changed. Um, and we didn't actually fundamentally change anything. We just clarified some things. So we um, had uh, some of the like funnier disagreements are our insect heads insects. Like that was like the midge example I gave. We weren't sure, you know, are those insects if it's just the heads, um, or is it insects if it's just the eggs? And so we had to clarify. We're like, okay, any life stage, as long as it's an insect, and you know, you can actually tell that it was there. Um, and then we also, you know, we couldn't, uh, apparently we couldn't agree on what two years means. Because um, I was interpreting it as like you have data points that are like at least 13 months apart. But some people thought that it meant that you had to have, you know, 24 months of data. Um, so we had to clarify that. <laughs> um, so it's just like, yeah, those little things where you think that you've written everything perfectly and then you realize that everyone thought that they understood things the same. But, you know, there's a mismatch there. Um, so yeah, I guess I don't remember all the changes, but if you want to look at the version one to version two, that might give you a sense of the types of things that have to be really explicit. So, uh, I would just echo that a little bit. Uh, you know, we've done a lot, of, a lot of projects in this space now, and, and every single project has involved, you know, some iteration on the protocol. When when we first started doing these things, that kind of went into it thinking like we were going to nail everything down the first go and uh, put a lot of effort into that. But uh, it just never works out. So it's almost better, you know, sometimes just to start and, uh, you know, have a rough idea of what you're going to do and then and then iterate towards that, that perfect protocol. Um, I was looking at some of your publications before this and, and uh, a couple came up. First, let me just throw something in the chat. Um, Eliza has this amazing uh, GitHub Dio page, all sorts of information about her uh, her research, and let me just throw that there. Um, you can see a lot of her publications there and a lot of the tools she talked about, like Lit Searcher, Synthesizer, Topic Tagger. Uh, she's involved in the, in the Metaverse project as well. Um, one of the publications was a new ecosystem for evidence uh, synthesis. And uh, we really love this idea, you know, at CISREV, it's kind of what we're trying to work towards, um, this idea of like a open source uh, evidence synthesis community. Um, I don't know if our idea of what that is lines up so well with what your idea is uh, or the group of authors who wrote it with you. Could you describe that idea of a new ecosystem for evidence synthesis? Yeah, so that comes out of the evidence synthesis hackathon that was in um, Canberra in Australia a couple of years ago. Um, and it's just kind of, yeah, a general discussion about the feeling that, you know, synthesis needs to be more open, um, especially there's a lot of people who think of people who do meta-analysis as almost like, like research parasites, where we're taking data that other people, you know, been out in the field for, you know, 40 years tracking these butterflies and like alpine meadows, 
and like putting in so much work to collect this data. And then they feel like you just kind of like scoop in, take it, put it in the meta analysis, um, and like you don't really deserve to have that data. Um, and you know, that's I, I can kind of see where people are coming from, but at the same time, you know, there's so much variation in data and so much heterogeneity that you really need all sorts of different data sets from different places and collected at different times and with different methods to really get a general picture. And I feel like that's kind of what everyone should be working towards is to, you know, really understand the questions, not to hold on to their data. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a theme that's kind of emerging across a lot of disciplines is, you know, needing to be open and share data and things like that. Um, and so we want just kind of the same things to be applied in synthesis where people feel like they're included part of the process and that it's not, you know, this uh, kind of two-stage thing where you have the primary researchers and the synthesis, you know, we think they should really be the same thing because the people who are collecting primary data are the people who know the data best and should really be involved in the synthesis process, um, but who need, you know, the expertise that you might not necessarily have um, if you're focused primarily on field work. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, you know, making things more open and transparent um, in general, I think is a good thing. That's an interesting point. So if people who are like heavily involved in the primary research, you know, you're, you're asking a lot of them if you're going to add, add the burden of saying, understand exactly how to get this into all these shared databases and, uh, you know, how to do all this evidence synthesis stuff. Maybe they should just be focused on the primary research they're doing. But that said, do you, do you think that there's, you know, a, a missing link here or maybe something I don't know about for, for people who are doing that primary research to, you know, integrate the data that they're collecting uh, with with this downstream database you're building with you know open evidence synthesis so that no no one needs to come in and review their article you know they would already be integrated yeah I think and especially trying to that like that's definitely something that's missing like you said you know where there's not like a central place where all studies are tagged with the information associated with them especially going backwards you know there's so many you know millions of publications that it's you know you, how are you actually going to go back and retroactively tag all of those studies? So even if going forward, everyone could put, you know, their at least, you know, study metadata, not even necessarily the data itself into a central place, it's still only going to be going forward. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's such a huge undertaking that I don't know, I can't even really envision how we would get there um, from where we currently are. Uh, so I, I think we actually, once again, kind of, put too little time into the Q&A, but I do want to ask one, one last question. Um, we have one from TJ. He asks, are you at all worried that the original researcher may be biased about their data or findings or how it fits into the greater context? Yeah, we all do tend to you know, think that our research <laughs> is the most important um, and answers all the big grand questions in the universe. Um, and so I guess what we've done for Endogem is we've just said, you know, there's if you have a conflict of interest, if you know the person who did the study, if you did the study, you're not the one who gets to make the decision about whether or not it meets criteria and gets included. Um, so it's always reviewed by somebody who's, you know, a third party uninterested um, to try to eliminate some of those biases. Um, but I also think that, you know, people do know their own research the best. And if people can, you know, self um, submit metadata, you know, they know whether or not their data fits these criteria that we're looking for. Um, and so I feel like it's a different thing in reviewing to avoid conflicts of interest versus people saying, you know, here's this data set that you missed. Um, and, you know, everybody wants their data to be used. So we're hoping that um, it'll be contributed that way. So. Nice. So thank you very much, Eliza. I'm going to give a quick presentation on some feature updates now. And I think we're going to be short on time. So we might not have time to do a meetup at the end of this, but we'll try. And uh, yeah, we'll jump to that now. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.